All right, so uh, today's intro question is, how did Target know a 16-year-old girl was pregnant before her dad did? Uh, that's gonna be our introduction into the topic of data mining. So, Lauren, you had a hand. Yeah, I know this case. Um, they, her search results, she was searching her pregnancy and then the ads popped up on Target. So I actually think it was a bit, so it ended up being a bit more sophisticated than that, which is the even creepier part. But basically the long story short of it is yes, she was buying stuff that was pregnancy related or searching stuff that was pregnancy related. And once she searched in the search bar, um, Target was able to identify she was pregnant. That's the short version. The long version gets even more uh, complicated. So basically um, it's worth talking about it just as like a case study in how extreme the uh, nature of technology is. So first off, um, well, let's just talk about the example and then we'll use it as a demonstration of data mining. So here's the basic idea behind it. Um, big companies have mailing lists and they have mailing lists that are associated with particular types of things. So for instance, if you are really into Legos, you can sign up at lego.com and get all the new Lego news. Um, likewise, if you are pregnant and you want cheap diapers and baby food and formula, you can go on the Target website and say, I'm looking to sign up for deals for baby related stuff. Um, Typically, you're only going to sign up for that if you are what? Pregnant. So you're not going to be, very few people are signing up for diapers for babies unless they have a baby or are planning on getting one very soon. So because of this, what this means is target background. Every time you go to a big store, um, you have a shopper ID number. And anytime you buy something, that shopper ID number is going to be collecting information about you in particular. How do they get the shopper ID number? It is general, it's gonna be randomly assigned, but if you have it, if you have an email address associated with it, that then becomes your shopper ID number. Also, if you use the same credit card to purchase on multiple occasions, every time that number comes up, it'll show like, oh, this is customer number 99999999 shopping. And so they will then store everything you've ever bought and basically like cookies on the internet only for your shopping, what time it is, what you're buying, how much you're spending, what time of day it is, et cetera. All of that gets collected every time you go into a store and swipe your credit card. Now, when you combine this set of data with, so if you have like a customer ID number, say like 999, and then you've got every purchase you've ever made. So that'll be your customer ID number, A, B, C, D, E, F. And then there'll be a third column, which is just, are you on the pregnancy uh, listserv basically, or the pregnancy coupons requests? If so, you get a yes. Now, what Target did is it took every single person who voluntarily signed up for the pregnancy Thing and analyze their purchases. And by analyzed here, I mean they basically put all the purchases into a computer and then asked a computer program, look for patterns in these data. Look for things that are these women are buying at much higher rates. Or also look at changes in these women's purchasing patterns given compared to what they were buying last year before they were pregnant compared to now that they are pregnant. If so it'll pick up on things like, you know, diapers or baby food, and it'll flag those. But it also started flagging things that were far less obvious to recognize. So, you know, like in a sex ed class, when a woman becomes pregnant, a lot of things happen with her body and blah, 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 blah. And basically one of the many things that happens is sensory things can change. So uh, sense of smell might change somewhat foods that you used to find delicious will no longer be tasty. Things that used to be horrible are now very yummy. All of these things can happen. And just by changes in hormone levels, everything else. And what they found was women who had in the past very often bought scented hand lotion, when they became pregnant, 
because their sense of smell had changed, these smells were overpowering and very often switched to unscented hand lotion. So things like a sudden change in hand lotion scent was taken as an indication of something that was common to a lot of these women that were on the pregnancy list. These were things that no human being, just thinking about it, would ever have thought to look up, but they found at a much higher rates than average, there was sudden switch from scented to unscented. And there were many other things. This is a proprietary thing that Target didn't release all the information, but this was one of the many things they picked up on. So they now have, from this, a pattern of data about what sorts of things early term pregnant women tend to buy. And by doing this, they now have a way of predicting who might be pregnant. So everyone see, right now, everything is just looking at people we know are pregnant and seeing what their purchases are. That's the first step in this process. Now, how do you go from that to predicting who's pregnant? How can you use the same information to now, oh, Kiriakis? I was just gonna say, I don't know. I was just gonna say, I don't know. No, go for it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So by saying like, oh, if, so you, it's just a random person they start creating the same patterns as someone who's pregnant and assume that they're pregnant. Exactly. So this other layer you're adding on is basically what you did before is you start from the fact someone's pregnant to draw conclusions about what pregnant people buy. Then what you can start doing is looking at new people and seeing what they buy to draw conclusions about whether they're pregnant or not. Because once you know what the patterns are that are correlated, you can now go the other way and start to draw conclusions from the purchases to who is likely to be pregnant. So what Target started doing was identifying women as long before they were showing, starting to make predictions as to who was pregnant without them ever entering the baby list, and then providing them with coupons, knowing or being pretty confident this person was pregnant. And they ended up with a very complicated like formula for doing this to the point that it then, like the computer was no longer based on your purchases able to say, are you pregnant or not? It would say things like, based on this individual's purposes or purchases, there's an 83% chance that she is in her second trimester. And they were quite accurate with it. Now it wasn't of course a hundred percent, but if you're target and you send all of these things out and somebody is pregnant, you have the chance of getting more coupons. And this person now might be like, oh, target save me money. Now, of course this backfired initially. So um, the full story with the girl and her dad is basically she was 16. Her dad didn't know she was pregnant. Target had used this complicated formula, identified she was pregnant, and sent her a congratulations on your first child flyer. Her dad got it, went into the mail, found it, and was like, my 16-year-old daughter is getting stuff from Target trying to make her pregnant. This is appalling. Target, I'm calling you to say this is unacceptable. He called them. Target was like, oh my God. God, we're so sorry. That must have been a mistake. They then called back. They followed up a week later being like, we're so sorry this happened, to which the dad responded, actually, turns out there's been a lot happening under my roof. I didn't know my daughter is pregnant. Um, however, early on, Target was sending things like this that just said, congratulations on your first child to people who didn't want, didn't know that Target knew. And how did they feel? Needless to say, Violated. Yeah, violated and felt creeped out. So this was the initial thing that happened with Target. Now, does anyone predict what did Target do in response to this? Wait, I, 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 like, they started scanning it before they actually bought Yes. Something? Oh, yeah. So you, based on your hand lotion purchases, um, Target then, while you're still like months away from getting diapers, sent you a big ad in the mail that's without you telling them, without officially joining the pregnancy thing, just based on your purchases, sent a thing that said, congratulations on your first child, here's some coupons. People didn't like that very much. So can anyone predict what Target did in response? How did they get around this slash solve this problem? Glitch. Say that again? So yeah, at first they claimed like whatever, but then they didn't... Do you think they stopped sending people the coupons? No. No, they sent, what they discovered though is people don't like this. This isn't very effective. People don't use these coupons and don't want to go and shop at the company that does creepy stuff like this. So what do you do in this case? You just hide the fact that you're sending people coupons. So instead of sending them things that said, congratulations on your first child, you just send them a generic looking book 
with a bunch of stuff for baby things next to things like chainsaws and vacuums and things that a normal person would totally buy. Knowing as Target that they are very interested in baby stuff, but you don't want them to know that you know that they are pregnant. So instead, you put in something like diapers right next to a lawnmower right above a basketball. You know this person is not interested in lawnmowers or basketballs. You know all they're interested in is the diapers, but you don't want them to know that you know that all they're interested in is the diapers. And so what Target started doing was sending these coupon books that were designed to get people to shop for baby supplies at Target, only disguised as if they were not specifically designed in that way. So that's the story of how Target started discovering whether people were pregnant and uh, based entirely on their purchases and how they then monitored their or changed their coupons to get to use this data in a way that didn't freak people out quite so much. Curiosity. Um, is there a reason why they were so fixated, fixated on like baby products? Did they do with other products? So they basically, short answer, this is the one that came out in the news. But they do this sort of stuff with many things. But basically, there is a reason with baby products is, and it's not just baby products, it's rather that, um, so one is it's a big money. Like, Babies poop a lot. You need to keep getting more diapers. So it's just like infinite amounts of, of money being printed every time that baby poops. So that's one reason. But another thing they found is they ended up doing it for things not just baby products. What it basically is, humans are creatures of habit like completely creatures of habit. Once we have our shopping routine, we basically stick to it our entire life until something major in our life changes. And so they targeted pregnant women, not necessarily just for baby products, but because this was going to be a major life change that was going to fundamentally shift things. And therefore, if you could get these people shopping at Target, they are now for the next however many years they're raising this kid until it leaves home going to be a target shopper. So it was just, it's partly because of the baby products and printing money. And also partly because if you can get them into the store buying the baby products, they're always going to be coming to you for that product. And they're going to then also buy the paper towels and the everything else. Now, other things. So these sorts of things are like one very clear um, example, but Something as simple as what is on the display at the grocery store of like big chain grocery stores, like what they put out at the end of the aisles is very much judged on these sorts of like data mining things based on what type of year it is. So like, it's not just that they're trying to push uh, pumpkin spiced things around this time of year. It's rather they recognized that people want pumpkin spice things. And if we put them in a convenient spot at the end of the aisle, then we will sell more of these pumpkin spice things than we otherwise would have. Come springtime, we're gonna put up things that are spring dessert related. When football season starts, the Tostitos and chips and salsa and Doritos are all of a sudden right front and center. They also then start, so these sorts of data mining things of um, if you can get pregnant people in, you then start to get more pregnant shoppers, and then you can start putting things that pregnant people would also need to buy and might not know are at Target near the baby stuff. So, you know, you might not realize that Target sells, uh, I don't know, something that, what would be something that a person wouldn't necessarily know Target would sell, but, uh, or I guess, oh, so like maybe baby monitors, then you don't think of Target as selling electronics. So you put the monitors near the other things or um, flashlights so, or night lights or all these sorts of things. All of this ends up being with like mining this data to get this information. So this is what data mining is. It's the act of basically getting huge data sets, asking a computer, hey computer, find some patterns in these sets and then using that information in various sorts of way. The mining part of it is just the digging around in so just like physics, so like physical mining, how does physical mining work? Like the stuff for gold or anything like that? What are you doing? You're digging around in a lot of dirt. And most of what you find is useless dirt. But every once in a while, you find a piece of gold and it makes you a ton of money. In the same way, you dig through all this data and it would never, most of it is going to be completely useless to you. But some of it is going to be gold, like being able to tell that somebody's pregnant based on their hands lotion purchases.
So that's the basic idea behind what data mining is. Um, everyone on board with what it is. This is just like description of the what's. And let me just mark down people who came in a little late. Sakshi's here. So basically the credit card companies do that on using our like just using our credit cards. Yes. So credit score is generally speaking another result of data mining type but thing. Are they, are they like other companies, like tech companies that sell our data to companies? Like the, like the credit cards that we sell that our data to? So I'm not sure around credit cards what the legality of it is. Um, there might be special rules about financial purchases, but I do know that something like Google searches will sell that on. So then somebody like Amazon can collect all of your shopping data in one place, get a pattern and then sell like this person is likely to be inclined to buy these types of shoes. And so the way in which, you, so this is really where the targeted ads come from. It's not just the stuff we talked about last time where they're like, you know, you look at a particular pair of shoes and therefore you get an ad for that pair of shoes later. That's the basic stuff. The complex stuff is when it starts to look at, well, you bought this shoe and these these hair products and you live in this area code and you went to this college based on that our computer algorithm projects that you'd be inclined to buy this type of sunglasses and therefore that sunglasses will pop up and you'll think huh i like those sunglasses and the reason you like them is because you fit their pattern and if you don't like them you never even noticed that they tried to sell it to you and you didn't and then the fact you didn't click on it then becomes another piece of data down the line. So, you know, the first time they think that you're gonna like sunglasses that look like this and you don't even click on them. And so now they know, all right, round lenses, sunglasses, those are out, that's another piece of data we can add into our mining. And now next time we'll send you like this shaped ones. <laughs> um, so that is what data mining is. Everyone on board with the what it is bit. We all good computer people? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Give me one second to. All right. With. All right. I don't feel like erasing this right now. All right. So, what are the concerns, ethically speaking, about data mining? First off, what are the positives of it? I don't want to totally ignore the positives of data mining. What? Why is it that this exists? And why is it that it's big business? And why is it that we, one, many people, even those who know it exists are not up in arms about it? Yeah. yeah, it gives you what you want. There is the customized customer experience. It's customized and does save time. It greatly saves time. You, If you as the customer, are uh, given what you are looking for without you having to search for it for a long time, that saves you time. But another aspect of this is that it ends up saving companies huge amounts of time and money. So let's talk about something like indeed.com. What is indeed? Anyone? Here. It's a job hunting. Yeah, it's a job hunting site. And basically it's a place that companies can look for candidates. So they post that they're looking for a certain job on indeed. And then you upload your resume and a few other things. And Indeed will then give the people, the company, the, the uh, set of best qualified candidates for that job. Now, how is it that Indeed does this? How is it, is there somebody at Indeed sitting there just looking through all the resumes? No, rather they use data mining. And so let's talk for a second and talk AI. So artificial intelligence, what is it? Generally speaking, what do we mean by it? Uh, maybe technology that can learn. Yeah, so generally speaking, there's a bunch of different definitions. The stereotypical we think about in sci-fi movies is like a robot that comes to life and becomes self-aware. Uh, that's not the type that people, when you hear it in a business context, are actually talking about. There's other th types. One of the keys is that it can learn. And what this basically means is it's a program that by giving it more and more data, it corrects itself. So algorithm, I have no idea how to spell algorithm, 
but do people know what an algorithm is? Just generally speaking, it's a big fancy word that just means complex mathematical formula with a bunch of variables in it. And so what it will be is just a very, very long list, like a very long formula where each of these variables will be plugged in by something you have in a data set. So for instance, you would have, you could have an algorithm, your GPA is calculated by an algorithm. What it does is it takes the letter for each class you have, converts that into a number out of four, adds them all together and divides by the number of classes you had. That's all we mean by algorithm. These are just long formulas for doing these sorts of things. But there are also much more complicated ones. So for instance, um, credit card companies have ones to calculate what your credit score is. It will take into account how much you spend a month, how, how many times you've missed a payment, how much you're in debt, how many things you, how many credit cards you've uh, opened. All of these things go into this long formula and it spits out a number based on all the variables and their calculation for how to add them together, et cetera, et cetera. So AI is just basically, there's two real ways of doing it. So what Kiriakos brought up is it's a, basically an algorithm that corrects itself. So the algorithm will spit out an answer. And then based on what that answer is, that answer will then get fed back in to see if it was right. And if anything was wrong, the algorithm will change itself to get better for the next time. But generally speaking, it doesn't even, it's not necessary. Like most of the time it's these self-learning algorithms, but sometimes people simply use the phrase AI for any sort of computer decision-making. So anytime a computer makes a decision, that is what AI means in the modern context. So if Indeed spits out, these three people are the best candidates for your job based on our preliminary look at everything, that was decided by an AI program where this just means a piece of software whose job it is to spit out answers to questions. You ask it the question, who are the three best candidates who applied? The Indeed algorithm spits out, these are your three best candidates. All right, so how do we get here on Indeed? So we got on Indeed because it used to be the case that if you were a company, you had to actually look at every resume that came in and everyone had to, you had to have physical people look at every resume that came in to see, is this person qualified? Nope, throw it away. Is this person qualified? Nope, throw it away. Now you just hire Indeed. Indeed has a program that a handful of people wrote you pay them a monthly fee, and now they get it down to the five best candidates for your job. And you no longer have to look through 500 applications. You look through five. And you can be pretty confident, as long as the Indeed algorithm works, that these five are all good people for the job. You just saved yourself time. And because time is money, you just saved yourself money. Also, it can be used to do things like help you make a better business decision. Or in the realm of sports, it can be used if you're, um, so one of the main like biggest like data analytics things to make it into like the public discussion was sports teams hiring data analytics to analyze players' performances in the past to predict how good they're going to be in the future. So if a guy has an incredibly good year, you can look at the numbers and from those numbers and what your algorithms have said, you can predict, was this person's really good year complete luck? Or was it rather that they've become a much better player un unexpectedly? Or you can analyze, we used to have one really good player and we had to pay him $50 million a year. But can we get just that same amount of value, like as good of a player by paying two guys $5 million a year? So these are the ways in which it does give you competitive advantages in a lot of ways. It saves you money. It saves you time. And it does allow you to learn things that you wouldn't otherwise know. Like I would never have thought to think of hand lotion as an indicator that somebody's pregnant. However, Target using these sorts of things was able to do that. So these are the positive benefits of data mining. Now, why is it that we're talking about data mining in the ethics class? Well, there's of course the other side. So what just to you all, what are some of the worries about this? Like, first off, is anyone completely not in any way worried by the existence of this stuff? Is there anyone who's just like, it's the world, whatever? So those of you who are worried, why? What is it about data mining that has some worrying consequences behind it? And we can unpack them a bit more. Here, I'll go. 
biggest worry is the lies of like social media and just how much they can learn about you and like cater an entire profile to you to show you exactly what you want to see. So yeah, so this, and we're going to be talking about this more next week, is how it can lead to echo chambers in a certain sense, where if you end up seeing only what already agrees with what you want to see, mm -hmm. what can end up happening is that you end up only believing things you already believed even more strongly than this used to be the case. So one issue with it is while it is customized, that's not always a good thing. It can lead to incredible biases in people based on you showing them on social media what they want to see. And now all of a sudden you, I'm gonna move this over here so the computer people can see. Shown. So yeah, if you, if it's customized to you, your background beliefs, your background assumptions are never going to get questioned because all you're shown are things that already agree with those because those are the things you're more likely to click on. So that's one issue with it. What are some other worries? Does anyone have any other things that come to mind of worries around this? Learn. It might be too simple on that. I am like worried about being manipulated. Like the fact that they're just showing me whatever I want to see or manipulating me to buy something, you know, especially if like the run is higher. Yeah. So another issue is this manipulated bit. Um, is to what degree are you in control of your own actions if what's being put in front of you is catered for you? Now you might just say, like, on the flip side, so you might just say that this is no different from human history, always. We always are trying to convince each other of things. You know, why do we get dressed up to look somewhat nice? Or why do we, like, yeah, so why do you get dressed up? Well, you're trying to manipulate others in a context to feel a certain way about you. Um, so maybe you just say, well, this is no different from that. But I do wonder, does anyone have thoughts? Is this, if this is different, how is it different? It's different because like uh, this is um, on your screen, like this is something that's in front of you that you may have not even clicked on something that has anything to do with shopping related, but it just pops up on like an article that you're reading. So I think it's manipulation in the fact that like, it's not the same because like when you're going to an event, you expect everyone to dress up. If you're going to a function, everyone dresses up. So you're not manipulating people into, I mean, maybe you're like, you know, just putting on a facade. But like, yeah, but there's a lack of awareness because you're not actually asking. And I think this is, a, there is some sense of, so do people know what subliminal messaging is? It's yeah. this idea that if you show very short images of something, it can change people's opinions. And there's never actually been any research that suggests that actually flashing like buy more Coke is gonna lead to more people to buy more Coca-Cola or more cocaine. Like doing that is not gonna affect it. Now. Um, there are certain sorts of things you can change people's moods if you flash things like grotesque photos. Um, you flash a bunch of photos of dead bodies very quickly. It will lead people to feel worse and they won't quite know why. But it generally isn't like a, you flash by this and people straight up buy it. But it does seem like in this sort of sense, there is a way in which you are unaware of the fact that these things are going on, which makes it feel a little more manipulative than it otherwise might have been. So actually says worried about losing it. Um, losing a sense of reality because all the information is sensed, uh, sent to you. And so, yeah, another thing is when things are really catered to you and all you see are the same things, it ends up that you have people who in some sense are almost living in separate realities. If the only things you read are about, um, say, things given to you by one political party's viewpoints and not somebody else's, or even more so, you just have things that are being discussed to you that people on the other side of a political or religious aisle um, never even encounter because it's not on their feed. You can literally have situations in which people are living in some sense in a different reality. Yeah. Um, have you heard of like the effect on like Twitter had on the 2020 election? So um, save this discussion for next week just because we're going to uh, talk about it a bit more. But yes, the short answer is there are major cases. And one of the things that this ties in with the data mining is um, things like the campaigns in 2016 and 2020. Uh, politicians were able, based on people's likes, to identify the people who were not yet decided on what to vote for. 
but we're going to be open to certain types of uh, advertisements. So they identified the people who were like the Trump campaign did an amazing job, especially early on when it was still like many Republicans, identifying those voters through their Facebook who were not yet committed to Trump but would be very inclined to become fans of Trump if it was presented to them in the right way. And so these are the sorts of things where like, it does give the people who understand and have access to the data incredible amounts of uh, power to either manipulate or at the very least give you a catered experience that makes it easier in a time of high stress and low attention to draw the conclusion that they want you to draw. Um, any other things that people want to highlight here that are worries? If no one else is going to talk about it, I want to go back to something we talked about last time, which is the implications for consent. So what did we say last time about consent? What did we say it takes to consent to something? Yeah, you have to understand it and agree to a particular thing. So if I consent to, uh, you know, if I consent to give you a dollar, that doesn't mean I've consented to give you all of my money. There's a difference here. And it has something to do with what, uh, how I conceive of it and what I'm capable of being aware of is very important in this. Now, the issue here is that what data mining brings up is a question about consent about implicit data. So what do we mean by this? Well, implicit data, the opposite of any, something that's implicit is something that's explicit. So what does explicit mean? What is something that is explicit? Exactly. It's exactly how it appears. That's what explicit means. So it's the, if I'm being explicitly hostile to you, you can tell from my face and the way I'm treating you, I'm yelling at you, I'm being mean. That's explicit. What is implicit then? You're implied. Yeah, it's implied. It's not out there. It's kind of hidden. You could maybe get the answer, but it'll take some thinking to get there. So the question here is one way in which data mining is often described is it's about finding the implicit data in data sets. So for instance, in the target case, what the algorithm is doing is it is finding the implicit likelihood that you are pregnant. So your per what's explicit here is your purchases, but then they are trying to find the implicit data like 80% chance of being pregnant, or in other cases, 55% chance of becoming a Trump supporter. That's the implicit data. And the question is, when you give consent over explicit data, do you count as giving consent over the implicit data as well? So I'm not sure. So it's clearly the case of like, you don't, if you give consent about something explicit, you aren't giving consent about something else that's just related to it. So like, if I consent to give you a dollar, that doesn't mean I'm consenting to give you a hundred dollars. But there is this thing, a question of like, if I agree to tell you, like if I agree to tell you that I eat a hundred thousand cookies a day, in some sense, I also consent to tell you that I'm going to die of a heart attack. Like that's such an obvious conclusion to draw that there's a real question of like, yes, I may not have explicitly said I'm unhealthy, but um, it's an easy conclusion. So in that sense, maybe I have given you, I didn't explicitly tell you I have, I had like, or let's say I, uh, let me think of the best way of putting this. If I tell you that I, um, You're hinting. yeah, so I'm hinting it in a certain way. So in that case, I am giving you implicit. If I tell you, I spend like a hundred thousand dollars a week on cocaine <laughs> explicitly, I'm telling you, I spend a hundred thousand dollars a week on cocaine implicitly. I'm telling you, I have a cocaine addiction. I'm not coming out and saying it, but you can connect the dots. So if that's the case, does that mean that in those sorts of cases, like we don't have a problem with the implicit data? Um, did somebody on the computer just want to say something? I feel like I may have cut someone off and I didn't see it. If not, I can. No, I was just laughing. Okay. Um, Netta. I just want to say, like, when you asked, I, I thought, like, I mean, I didn't know that we become, we just become patterns. Like, that's what we become. That's what we become. That's what we you don't agree to it, but they assume it, and then that's just becomes. So, and I want to jump on this one a bit more. This sense in which we become patterns and lose individuality is another consequence of this. 
that we might think is good and might think is bad for both better and worse. But um, before we get to that, I want to highlight the fact that it does seem like in some cases, we giving away explicit data does count as, or giving away explicit data that has clear implicit data is okay. But it does seem somehow that in a data mining case, it's different. There's something about the fact that the average human isn't able to compute the likelihood of pregnancy from someone's purchases does make this seem like a bit weirder. Kira, because you can a lot of things be implicit? I want to know like the extent of what it implicitly is. Like let's say, hey, I'm 20 years old, I'm more likely to like video games. Is that implicit? Or is that just so obvious that it's not considered implicit? I think that's the big key here is, and I think this is why there's the ethical issue, is companies are going to try, the people who are doing this data mining want to say, knowing that you're 80% pregnant based on your purchases is the exact same thing as being able to predict that at age 20, you're more likely to buy video games than someone who's 85. And they're going to say, if you're okay with that one, you should be okay with this one too. And there is a real problem here. Of, okay, you want to say that there's some implicit data that shouldn't be allowed. Where do you draw the line? Where does it become too implicit? Lauren? I also think that with like anything online, it's easy to actually just say what you're doing. Like, why can't they be explicit about everything that they're doing? Because they're actually doing that. Like, they can actually tell us exactly what they're doing. Like, it's not something that they have to draw any conclusions to. Like, it's just something that, like, you know, I don't know. So I, there's a couple reasons, like there's practical reasons for it of like you tell, Target tells you they're doing this and people are going to like Target less. So I think that but, is part of it. I mean, it. that's absolutely why they're doing it. Yeah. But it's more like, it's that whole thing of, we, I understand why that they're not telling us in, like, explicitly and they are just implicitly relying on this, but that's where it gets like really annoying because like, you know, if they just told us what we were doing, then if everyone told us what they were doing, then we would just pick and choose who was doing what. Yeah, but sometimes, you know how sometimes when in a relationship somebody cheats and the other person, like, oh, he didn't know, but like sometimes you know, but you just don't want to know. Because if you knew, it, it takes away the, like, it's easier to just say, to not know, but like, to like ignore the fact that they're doing it and admitting that that's, because I think if we knew it, it would be much harder for us. Like if we were always conscious about it, it was it was gonna be much harder for us to be part of it. And I think the other practical reason is there's big business in this. And you don't, if you're a company, if you are Google and you have a proprietary algorithm that's really good at identifying pregnant people, you don't want um, so you or it's, let's say your target, you don't want Walmart to get that. So that's the other issue behind it, is it gets tied in with notions of trade secrets and other sorts of things. But I also think that they hide it because there is a morality issue in it, like that you, like, because what's like, what's done in dark is, is it, it's done in dark for, for a reason, because it's like, it, it's, in, it's in the, yeah, it's in the gray area, so that's yeah. like, I mean, do you guys think that they're that obvious? I think they're super obvious nowadays. Every single company, I don't think they hide it at all. So I think in some ways they don't hide it at all, but the exact extent and exactly what the proprietary decisions they're making are, are certainly still hit. Like we don't yeah. quite know the, like we all know that Facebook provides us with the political arguments we're going to like, but we don't quite know. It's one of those things like, um, like you, you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Um, you don't quite want to see what they're judging and how they're doing it. Because sometimes, like, there are certain types of things where, like, if you if you like every single picture you see of someone with an assault rifle and they use that to judge you, like, that doesn't feel in some way that problematic. But if they start to do things, like, based on what types of trees are in the background of your photos, because they've identified that people who happen to be in front of oaks, generally speaking, prefer, like, liberal candidates because of where oak trees are in the country compared to, like, maples or something like that, I think that's the sort of case where it starts to get, like, a lot more gray area yeah and i think that that's like it does seem like intuitively we seem okay with implicit data where if we could make the connection it's okay but i do think there is this worry of then where do you draw the line like does this mean that uh you know if we had einstein here and he could think all of these steps ahead then it's completely okay for him to use all this implicit data but somebody who's not as einsteinian can't like i think it does you end up with this big Gap here. That's it. Well, I, I I understand like it's very accurate most of the time. But I also think isn't there a point of, like 
of limits and what a computer can calculate in the end of who you are and exactly what like it, it, it is limited. So, and this is exactly um, the issue that you kind of touched on before. And I think it's a really nice transition. Another ethical issue around it is when you end up drawing on these large sorts of generalizations and large patterns, you sometimes lose sight of the details of a particular individual's life. And it ends up, everything becomes black and white instead of Right. So one of the issues that has been happening with things like Indeed.com coming about is while on the one hand, they make it much easier for a company to hire and save them a lot of money. One thing that it's doing is making it hard for people with non-traditional backgrounds to get a job in a certain field. So for instance, the Indeed formula will calculate based on a large number of people what the ideal person to work in finance is, or the ideal person to work as, um, say, to, to get a job working as a, uh, I don't know, a lawyer for the NFL or something like this, or let's just go with a, like a banker of some sort. They'll identify if you want to, most bankers will have gone to four years of college immediately out of high school and will take exactly four years to get through college, statistically speaking. Also, they will have gone to this school or this school. And also they will have majored in finance and then had a um, internship of this type and yada, yada. So there's a pattern of what the ideal banker looks like. And very often they will just throw out resumes right at the start just to whittle down the numbers of people who stray from that pattern a lot. So for instance, if you're somebody who took 10 years of college through to do college, you might get thrown out simply for the fact that you took 10 years, not take into account anything about why you took 10 years. So if you took, if you're in a job interview with another person and the person is like, why did it take you 10 years to get through college? And you're like, well, my dad had a stroke and I had to take care of him and could only, I was working two jobs and could only do night classes. And it took me 10 years while I was also taking care of my younger brother. A human being is able to take that extra data into account. An algorithm doesn't have a blank spot for that. So it's just going to automatically black and white say, you aren't a good candidate because it took you 10 years. And this sort of individualistic consideration ends up getting thrown out and we just become patterns as Netta said. Um, there's still value like in a first interview. So, and so, um, it's the best way of putting this. Like, uh, do you think people are trusting computers too much? Or do you think we still have that ability to trust ourselves? So I think in some ways, and one of the problems is that if these things become strong enough, what ends up happening is people only trust the computer. And if the computer says something, then face-to-face -face gets ignored. Now I do think most quality businesses will do a face-to-face -face interview. It's just the problem because they get so many resumes now, the early cutting stages, you don't do that. And just to justify like why these things though are sometimes good is going back to our social psychology stuff, human beings are also not perfect decision makers. So one of the things that they've often found is interviews for jobs are not necessarily a good way to determine who's going to be good at the job. And a lot of times, what they found is interviews could actually do damage because you had the main, like how person you have a job in which somebody's trying to be like a, spending their entire day in front of a computer coding. Well, how personable they are to you face to face is not necessarily an indicator of how good they're going to be. And very often the social psychology things we talked about, like, are you an attractive person started giving people like benefits in a job setting where it didn't make them any better at the job. They just got chosen because they were attractive. Or in one of the reasons data analytics really took off in sports is that there were all these old timey scouts who had particular views of what a good player looked like. And they started like missing out on all these talented players. The analytics guys came in and were like, that guy's actually really good. You just don't value him because he's five foot four. And they were like, we'll pay that guy half as much as you pay your big bad player. And we're going to be a lot better than you. Yeah, that's that's that is so. Those of you who've read or seen Moneyball, that is the story of Moneyball, um, and that's so. All sports teams now have big data analytics companies to offset these biases. The problem is when you start only listening to the numbers, you can run into problems too. And I think this not only do we become patterns, we end up with these very unfair generalizations that end up happening. Um, 
So there have been cases in which individuals end up being biased against because a computer algorithm mm -hmm. said they fit a pattern that is unacceptable. So to go with one of the most blatant cases, back in the financial crisis in 2008, um, when a lot of people were foreclosing on their mortgages, they couldn't pay it back, banks started deciding who to give mortgages to in large part based on their zip code. So if you lived in an area in which there had been a lot of foreclosure, of people not able to pay back their mortgage, then very often um, the banks, even if you had a perfect credit score, would not give you a loan or mortgage for your buy a house simply because you were trying to buy in a certain zip code. And so you just became kind of the victim of this more general, broad sort of machinery. And so there's this sense in which as while these things have many benefits, on the flip side, they can also lead to like a depersonalization and an ignoring of particular individual circumstances. Um, does anyone have any other issues that they can think of with these sorts of things? Either in terms of the positives or negatives on this. Could be like the um, children too. Like, um, I mean, maybe that comes up today, but it's more like, Children. So one thing definitely is that these things are also because they happen below the surface, a lot of them are used in ways to manipulate children in ways that you wouldn't. I mean, why is it that Instagram is so popular? There are many reasons, but one of the reasons is because the app is literally designed to get you addicted to it. So why is it that you can Well, it's because that triggers into the dopamine response in your brain of you do something, you press something, and then in response, you get a new pretty image. So that then you get a little shot of a nice feeling as you see the new image, which then encourages you to flick your finger again, which gives you the shot. And then you've basically become a rat in a cage pressing a button for a piece of food. It's literally, they, there's a reason it's not just like 40 tiny pictures, it's one picture at a time that you flip through. Well, because that's the one that you're going to get most addicted to. So do you mean extremes in terms of, um, is this tied in with the, what you are presented with extremes or in terms of like, you end up with these extreme yes or no's in cases where you need, um, cause I think there's a lot of extremes it's, yeah, it's creating. I, I think it's what about trends, like this um, idea of like setting trends that you can't get out of because everyone's doing it. So um, I don't know if everyone's seen the Black Mirror episode where it's the B one. I have not and, seen it. Oh, okay. It's, it's, Black Mirror hits too close to home for me. I guess I, I, I get I get freaked out. out. Um, so yeah. So um, yeah, it can lead to basically it ends up where. Um, I think part of it is once a company, yeah, pressure to fit in is what Sasha just said. And I think this is exactly the issue where it ends up that if you identify what somebody of a certain age is going to like, such that enough people of that age like it, it then creates this monster that everyone has to like it or be left out in a way that can like basically, you know, you don't want to be the 14 year old right now who doesn't have TikTok. Like you are going to have no friends. Oh, sorry, it's the same with like the black box on like, um, you know, Black Lives Matter or like, you know, in the Black Mirror episode, it was death to this person. And everyone was like writing death to this like bad person. It's not it's somebody who did something bad. So it was just like, oh. Yeah, and I think the other thing that can be, um, like, the other thing that to be aware of is uh, these things end up being used in ways where you like, the level of manipulation can be somewhat troubling in the sense of it does begin to make you question everything in a certain sense. Like you can start to ask yourself, is the fact that this commercial has many people of color because this company cares about diversity or is it because they've data mined and discovered that their consumers care about this diversity to such a degree that putting a person of color in this advertisement is going to lead to more people buying their product. And so I'm not sure if like, leading to nihilism and like not being able to take things is like a problem or just like a fact, but I think that is another. Would you say it's a mutual benefit or do you think large companies are getting more 
So here's the thing. So it really depends on how you, so one thing to, to think about is, and I think another reason to bring this up is uh, reinforces power dynamics is another issue with these sorts of things. So one thing to, to be aware of is data mining really only works if you have access to huge amounts of data. Like you can't, none of us could like, like, I can't run a data mining on my students because I don't know enough about your lives and I don't have the processing power or computer ability to do so. However, a huge company is able to run those things. And like big politicians are able to run these things or governments are able to run these things. So there is a worry here. And I think this is both for better and for worse is, is the fact that data mining is the exclusive, I mean, as companies get better and better with computers, small businesses are becoming able to do it to some degree. But generally speaking, the bigger a company is and the more data it has, the more data it's going to be able to mine and the better conclusions it's going to be able to draw. And I think that that can really lead to um, some worries here. So I think that there are benefits for the average person, but I do think the people who have more data end up with much more benefit and a lot less negative than... Um, these sorts of things. And I think another thing that ties in with this is data mining. Um, basically, data mining and artificial intelligence only end up being as good as they're programmed to be. So we think of a computer. A computer is not biased. It's a piece of metal. It's a piece of silicone. It's got some chips in it. A, a computer cannot be racist. It cannot be sexist if it's just a physical piece of hardware. However, Oh, so, so ideally you then think, all right, moving on to these sorts of algorithms and AI would actually lead to a more fair and equal world. And so this is the way in which people think is if an AI program is the one deciding it, then it's going to be much fairer than it otherwise would have been. So that's the theory behind it. The problem is that a lot of these things end up just reinforcing a lot of our biases and problems in ways that we don't even realize. Like if somebody's being explicitly racist to your face, it is obvious that they're being racist. And it's very easy to say that person's being racist and have feelings about it. But if you've got a program that is making racist decisions for reasons that no one intended and without anyone being aware of the fact that it's racist, it can be a lot more nefarious and harder to identify. And so this is exactly the key. And the reason why um, this ends up being a problem is basically, yeah, co a computer might not be racist, but its programmers are human beings who are going to have biases and blind spots. Got it. You have a hand. Uh, I was going to say, because I actually spoke about that in another class. Um, it was something about like police, like record and stuff and like demographics. Mm -hmm demographics yes. that are like more likely to um commit certain crimes and it's like if it's using inherently like racist and skewed stats then even the technology is gonna have like a bias basically yeah, programmed so, into it um there was a, a famous case basically um there's this software that was being designed to judge how likely someone is to recommit a crime so if you are arrested for a crime this program was designed to analyze based on you, how likely are you to commit another crime? And it was being used by parole judges and parole officers to decide, should we allow this person out of jail early or are they likely to commit another crime? And what they started finding was, this was done for entirely uh, noble reasons. People were like, we, our judges aren't perfect. We want a completely fair way of doing this. We want it so that people are, treated fairly and correctly and have justice in our justice system. So it was done for a good reason. However, after it was operating for a few years, people started noticing that the score people were given was very closely tied to their race. So you would have one person who committed armed robbery who was white and it would say there was a 30 or like they got a, the higher the score, the more likely they were to commit another crime. So you'd have one person who was white who committed armed robbery and was given a three. And another person who was black, who was for the same crime, was given an eight. And they started to look at this and be like, well, what is going on here? And what they found were a lot of the questions they asked to determine how likely someone is were not intended, to, like they never anywhere asked, 
is this person black? But they started doing, they did include things like what neighborhood is this person from? Or what is this person's income? Or what is this person's, did this person have a single mom? A lot of things that were, while no way causally tied to race, correlationally tied. So what ended up happening is this program judged on these innocent questions started spitting out, this person is very likely to recommit a crime. And this person is less likely when in truth, the things from a, like you just look at the program from a bird's eye view and you realize, oh shit, Nobody meant it to, but given biases and socioeconomic history and all sorts of other things, this program was just racist and started saying Black people are more likely to commit crimes than white people are. And so if you build it into a, like an algorithm or a computer system, these sorts of things begin to be like, people wouldn't be able to look at this until they, the data came out and recognize, oh, this is racist. And so in some ways it makes it even harder to fight against these sorts of inequalities and oppression because the person who designed the algorithm is there and they don't remember exactly what the numbers are or what factors were taken in. So unless an algorithm is designed perfectly, it can end up just reinforcing the very biases it was being designed to get rid of. And it can never be perfect because human Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing is, and it's not just that humans, it's also that it ends up, um, because a lot of these algorithms are self-learning, what ends up happening is the biases that exist in the world, it ends up picking up on. So um, to give one famous example, are people, so facial recognition technology, everyone know what it is? It's a little thing that allows you to turn on your phone um, or everything else. And the basic way it works is, let me erase all these. Um, do people know how facial recognition technology works, generally speaking? All right, so here's the idea. A human face is basically, every human face has certain components to it. Mouth, nose, eyes, a forehead, cheeks. And basically every human being, if you line our faces up, we have a unique collection of distances between different things. And if you take all of those things together, you can basically come up with a very specific, unique shape to your face. So you measure the distance from here to here and here to here, here to here. And basically what you end up with is this weird little shape that is going to be unique to your face. And it'll like this measurement, this one. And so what gets stored in a computer system is just this. Now, what it does then is when it is presented with another photo, so this will be stored as data. Every time you look at your phone, what it does is it has a program that looks at what it's presented with in this moment, i.e. your face, and sees if the lines and what it's presented with now are the same or similar enough to what is stored in memory. So it stores in memory the test, like the practice one, you have to go like this a bunch, it memorizes that. And then in the future, when you hold your face up, it compares what it's showing to that. If it's similar enough, your phone will unlock. If it's not similar enough, your phone will not unlock. That's the basic idea behind facial recognition. And the way that they got these programs to identify it was you basically just show them a whole bunch of faces and then see how many of them it gets right. And if it gets it right, you tell it, yes, you got it right. If it gets it wrong, you tell it, no, you got it wrong. And then it tries again and it gets better and better and better over time. So the issue was what ended up happening is um, facial recognition technology they discovered uh, after it came into existence after a while, works really well for some people and really poorly for others. So does anyone know who facial recognition technology works great on? White people. White people and specifically white men. White men are exceptionally good at being recognized by facial technology. On the flip side, women of color are very difficult. So facial recognition technology was very good at identifying white men. Like it was working great on phones and yet you show it Michelle Obama and Oprah and it couldn't tell who was who. Yeah, that's just like when the police started using facial recognition. And so one of the cases in which this came up is when police started using facial recognition, white people who committed, so what they do is basically you look on a CCTV at a crime being committed, you scan that face and then bring in a suspect and see does the suspect's face align with what was seen on the CCTV. And they quickly discovered all the white people, it kept getting it right. And black, black women especially, it started getting it wrong over and over again and finding black women guilty when they had been nowhere near the crime. While white men, they consistently got it right. Now, why was it the case that this ended up happening? 
Was it because somebody decided, you know what? I love racism. Let's make racist computer programs. Does anyone know why this ended up happening? So part of it is the bigger sample size. Hannah. Is it because of the color recollection? So part of it is just there are physical facts about what skin tones reflect light. But part of the reason that the, these differences matter is because of the sample size of the people who were building the software. So who is building facial recognition technology? What Tech guys. And what does a tech guy typically look like? A white man. Um, in Silicon Valley, it's generally almost, it's, I think it's like 70% white men, like 25% Asian men, uh, or 25, 70% white, 25% Asian, and then 5% everybody else. And then it's like 70 to 80% men. Mm -hmm. So almost everyone building this was white men. And now these white men weren't specifically trying to design a program that was best at them. It's just when they were testing it, you were going to use who's at hand to test this program. So you'd be like, hey, you over there in the next seat, let's see if this program works. Let's test it. Let's test it. Well, that person's a white person, a white man, and you're a white man. And the next guy down the hall is a white man. And everyone you're testing it on is white men. What you end up doing is building a racist program because of the like historical factors that led most tech people to be white. So it's basically, it's not because anyone was trying. It's rather that just because the power dynamics led to white people being in tech, we ended up with those being the ones who it was tested on, making the program learn to be racist. There was another case in which somebody was trying to do like recognize women um, from photos, like I gender identify people based on their photos and they use as their test magazines. And they quickly learned that the number one way in which this thing was identifying the gender of the person in the photo was, was it in a kitchen? And they quickly, like found out like, oh no, our algorithm is learning to identify women based on whether they're in the kitchen because in magazines, men are in sports magazines and women are more commonly in like home goods magazines and home. So because of the biases within our magazines, the app or the, the recognition picked up on that and quickly became racist. It's why they, whenever they create a Twitter bot and they're like, or a, a Reddit bot and release it on Reddit within like a single week, it's like a full white supremacist. Um, <laughs> because whatever you present it is what it's gonna pick up on. Uh, so this is another worry with these, is when you have an algorithm doing things, unless you get the algorithm right and present it with fair data to learn from, it can end up reinforcing things and no one even realizes they're reinforcing it because of the fact that, uh, you know, it's a computerized program and it's in your mind perfectly unbiased. <laughs> social dilemma, I don't know if you watched it, it also said something about like, that they started all of those things with good intentions, yeah. right? and then it got a life of its own, and it like technology is much faster than we're able to like, catch up to it, and then it's just become this beast that we now try to like, take it a step back, and it's already. And I think another issue with it is the average person does not know what's going on in these algorithms. So if you are a police department, and you are told we have a new piece of technology that can identify criminals based on CCTV footage so you don't misidentify the wrong person. You as a police department with good intentions are gonna say, we would like that software. We want that because it will make our department more fair. The worry is though, if you don't fully understand it, which you can't unless you're working in the field, you end up with these sorts of unintentionally racist things, which, as I said before, are much harder to identify are racist than the cases in which, you know, somebody being like, I won't hire you, you're black, is much easier to identify and stamp down on than we aren't going to give you or you're more likely to be a criminal because of X, Y, and Z, which is a really long-winded way of saying you're bas like, basically you are black, therefore we're not giving it to you. But yeah. Um, all right, we have about five minutes left. Does anyone have any more questions, comments, concerns, feelings on any of this stuff? We could talk about the social credit system quickly or we can get going. Um, any social credit is the Chinese, uh, it's Chinese government's new data mining operation, which I can pause and we can talk about to those who want to keep talking about it and those who want to go can go, or I can just talk about it now. What are people feeling? Yeah, all right. 
How many people want me to talk about social credit mandatorily where you all sit here? Anybody? All right. Anybody? All right, so we've got a few. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. If you wanna get going right now, get going. If you wanna talk about this, stick around. Computer people, you're free to stick around. Human people, you're free to stick around. You're also, I will not be insulted if you leave right now. Like I'm opening it up, feel free. Um, but here's the basic idea of social, the Chinese social credit system is basically, I mean, let's, let's put some caveats first. It is a system that is in principle being built and is along the way in practice in very limited domains. But the dystopian view that I'm going to describe does not exist yet, and whether it, it would ever be practicable is unclear. However, the dystopian view of it is worth talking about in its own right, because it basically is the idea of data mining to the most extreme way. So we've been talking about data mining and data collect. Oh, Netta. Social credit? No. Dystopian. So um, this so dystopian and utopian. So utopia was a book written in like 1600s England, which described a perfect place that um, everything was great. Then, um, so the, the adjectival form utopian came to be describing a perfect place. Now, in response to that, someone came up with the word dystopian, which is to describe the opposite, a place that is very, it's like supposed to be fictional, but it's so bad. So dystopian is generally describing something which is the opposite of a perfect place. It's something that is so horrible that we only think about it in our imaginations. It's like the world of 1984, Big Brother. That was the ideal of dystopian that maybe we're starting to become dystopian in certain ways. So dystopian, the social credit system in China um, is basically the idea is what would happen if all of your social uh, data mined information about your life was collected and stored in a single place and controlled by the central government. And so the idea behind it is that you are given a credit score. So a credit card credit score basically says how good of a uh, person are you to give a credit card to. If you've got a high score, they're willing to give you a bigger loan. They're willing to give you a better credit card because they deem you a better person. You're more likely to pay things back. If you have a low credit score, then you're not going to be able to get the same sorts of credit cards that you would otherwise. Now, the social credit system is the same thing just applied to your life. And so the idea is, why don't we judge how good of a citizen someone is going to be based on huge data sets about every part of their life. So the idea is when you're born, you get a certain number of social credits. Let's just say it's 800. Then for each good thing you do in your life, judge good by this algorithm, you gain points. You donate to charity, that's plus 100. You uh, jaywalk, that's minus 10. And they could know you're jaywalking because the street corners in China have uh, CCTV with facial recognition on it. So every time you jaywalk, that's minus 10. Which is like a real thing. So it's beginning yeah. to be built. Yeah, I'm it's so be <laughs> it's beginning to be built. Every time you, um, let's see, where are some other ones? Every time you are seen assisting in building homes for free, you get some points, plus 75. Every time you, uh, you know, get drunk and rowdy, that's minus 50. And then other than you think, COVID safety as well. So if you're like vaccinated or not vaccinated. So you're vaccinated, you're taking care, you get plus 200 points. Yeah. If you're unvaccinated and not social distancing, that's minus 50 or something like yeah. this. So these are, and the idea is then you spit out a score. And this score, well, let's say you're a 1,050. Well, this then judges you are an above average citizen and you get special permissions or special privileges that you would not otherwise get. So maybe you can get a better credit card or maybe your bank loans will be lower rates or maybe you're given like a month's rent of like benefit. If you're very bad, then you are things like you are not given a visa to leave the country. You cannot get on certain trains. You cannot live in certain areas. And the, wor the most worrying part is... Um, so this is just the general sort of thing. But the real worry comes in of the quickest way to lose a lot of points is to insult the government. So that's the quickest way to lose points in this is um, somebody. So right now in China, it's not like the universal system is not in place, but there are some localized ones. And there are stories of people who are like uh, dissident 
journalists who have tried to leave the country on vacation, like people who write blogs that criticize the government, who have gotten to the visa office and been told, sorry, your social credit score is too low, you can't get a train ticket. You can't get a train ticket, you can't get a train ticket to the area you want to go to because you're trying to leave your province. Because the, because the train is under control of the same umbrella. Is the number of the only players that come to account? Yeah. Like legit, like train ticket, 600 points or above. Something like, yeah. yeah. And so one of the major issues that this person had is there's, because it's a number, there's no one to appeal to. It's just, it's this algorithm that says, you are a 1050, you're allowed to do this. You're a 400, you are not. You posted something, you posted um, uh, support for Hong Kong, you aren't going to be leaving your hometown for a year and a half. Like though that's the dystopian thing that is becoming possible because of all the data being collected, stored, and then an, an AI program that spits it out in one place. So even if somebody is committing a small crime, not even a crime, just one of these penalties, if it's over time, you're going to go over and over again. I'm pretty sure, and I'm not sure the detail, and they're still working on it, but yeah, basically once you have your score, you're stuck. Sachi says it's like a social jail, and in a lot of ways it is. It's like your life being judged. And so this is like, again, it is not fully in place, maybe it never does, but the theory itself is not that crazy given what we have now. So actually, one of my other classes, um, we had a Chinese student come in and she showed us her like social standing at the moment with the government and like what she could and couldn't do um, with it. So you just start getting benefits, but there's also things that you don't have benefits to depending wow. on your... So she didn't have benefits to things wow. because she had a 650 or something, which was like good. She's like, I mean, good social standing, but I'm not an amazing social yeah. standing. Can it ever be changed? Like if you do certain things like to improve your Yeah. Um, so if you give a shit ton of money to charity or you go to like political rallies in support of the government, you can get your scores up. So are like wealthy people like off like I think well, I think it's gotta be like certain types of things, but this is a final thing about um data mining that I want to talk about is another issue with it is that it ends up that if you have the if you happen to be in a beneficial place that you know what the variables are to change, you can end up artificially raising your scores on things. So um, one of the, the most, again, feel free to leave if you're not interested people on the computer, people here, you're all welcome to go. But uh, one of the most famous cases of this, are people familiar with what the US News and World Reports college ranking is? It's basically this stupid ranking that comes out once a year from this US magazine that just grades how good all the colleges are in the country. And they have a special formula that they use to calculate what's the best school. But I, I really have a question. Like, also like the US also has social so, so here, the, the main difference is that, um, so I would say that the U.S. social credit system at this point is less, uh, less centralized. So I think that um, one thing you can say is that like in the China, because China has much more control over its internet system, because basically there's only one fiber, so I think it's like five fiber optic cables into and out of the country, so they can really keep things under control. They can keep it very centralized. In the US, it's a much more, like we have a social credit system. If we didn't, um, cancel culture would not exist. Like that is our version of a social credit system. It's just that it's much more decentralized where it's much more, will people watch your movies? Will you get fired from your job? It's much less of a straight number. It's both more forgiving and much less structured. So like if you, if there, if you had blackface on at a party 50 years ago, it's kind of a crapshoot whether you're ever going to be able to have a job again. It depends on the context and everything else. So it's less structured. Well, in China, there would be a straight number for it. But I do, I think that's an important point you bring up is that like the social credit system as like this dystopian thing, the numbers bit and every like clear cut thing is very different. But in American culture, we have these sorts of things to a certain extent of like people will look at your Facebook and if you have bad pictures on there, you might not get a job from a certain company. That kid who... Uh, so do you remember early on in COVID, there was that kid who was like at spring break in Georgia and went viral being like, I'm not going to let uh, COVID get in the way of my spring break. And like, that kid's an idiot. Like something has to happen to this kid. And then my friend was like, 
you know, he's never going to get a job in his life, right? Because anytime anyone ever Google searches him for his entire life, that video is going to come up and they're going to think, oh, that's the idiot who wouldn't let COVID get in the way of partying. Like that guy is never going to get a job. And like, that is the social credit system in our more like spread out way. But the US News and World Reports one that's interesting is uh, they have this algorithm that was designed for good reasons to identify how good a college is and what, how, uh, good of an education you're gonna get there have a good one um and so one of the things that they discovered was uh the system was very very easy to manipulate so one of the things that they that goes into this is the acceptance rate and the idea behind this is harder schools get more applicants and are harder to get into so it's a very reasonable way of like doing it like because Harvard like gets a lot of applicants from around the world and not many of them get accepted. Well, that's correlated with them being a very good school and at a very good school, you're going to get a better education, blah, 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 blah. So it's designed for very good reasons. However, the fact that acceptance rate was included in the formula had this really strange consequence, which was that, can anyone guess you have, say you're a, like a big donor and you've got $50 million dollars you give it to your school. And if the school wants to get its reputation raised and go up in the US News and World Report's ranking, um, and again, this ranking is supposed to show you get the best possible education. The higher the score is supposed to be, the better the school for your education. If you get these 50 mil, anyone have a guess what the best way to raise your ranking was? Where should you put this $50 million? What department in your school should get it to make your ranking go up the highest, which again, is supposed to indicate that it's a good education. Admissions, admissions you'd think admissions. No. What was the other guess? I said recruitment. Wait, like, yeah, student recruitment. Um, any, uh, how many of you were thinking the um, athletics department? The quickest way to put $50 million in was to put it into your football team. Why? Or your college basketball team. Why? Because Americans love these things. And 18-year-olds, many of them, especially men, love going to a school with a good football team. Therefore, the number of people who applied went up when the sports team got better, thereby majorly lowering the acceptance rate. Because if all of a sudden you have 100 like 100,000 extra people applying a year and you don't accept any of them, well, your acceptance rate is much lower. So TCU shot up the rankings because their college football team got really good and a lot more people were applying, which is this really strange thing where, again, because it's an algorithm and people don't quite know how the sausage is made under the surface, you end up with this weird thing in which it becomes very exploitable to the people who do know the truth is behind it. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, computer people. Thank you all for sticking around. Um, human yep. people, thank you all for sticking around.